Good afternoon, and welcome to CAMERA's webinar with Arnold Roth. I'm Andrea Levin, Executive Director of CAMERA. We're delighted that you're joining us today. And as always, we thank you for supporting our work in defending Israel. We have known Arnold since very near the fateful, terrible day in 2001 when his beautiful daughter Malki was murdered during the terror war underway in Israel. It so happened a small camera delegation was in Israel for a solidarity visit, and he spoke to a group of us. Arnold, along with his wife, Freemit, has continued without let up for all the years since, seeking some measure of justice for their child. And today you will hear some of those challenges. They have included contending with often shockingly callous media coverage of Malki's fate and the status of her killer, Alam Tamimi, who walks free to this day. At one point, the New York Times ran a feature story romanticizing Tamimi, and Cameron then ran an ad in the Wall Street Journal denouncing the Times' despicable bias, and that's the only word for it. We also just assisted Arnold in getting BBC to take action on another media offense. I know many of you are familiar with this tragic event and like Arnold and Freeman, consider it an open account. Their courageous efforts on behalf of Malfi have meaning for all of us and resonance in the fight for a civilized world. We're proud to have Arnold with us today to hear where this story stands right now. Arnold is by profession an attorney. He made Aliyah from Australia and he lives in Jerusalem. We will take questions after he concludes speaking. And if you run your cursor along the bottom of your screen, you can see the icon there for Q&A where you can submit your questions. Uh, please do so along the way so that we can gather them and we will get to as many as possible. And now we are very pleased to pre present and welcome Arnold Roth. Andrew, there are very few people to whom I feel more um, obliged than you for the fine work that camera does in general and for the um, the unrelenting support that uh, camera and you have provided to us down through all the years i'm here this afternoon to talk not so much about the shattering events of the summer of 2001 but rather the nightmare that has unfolded in stages since that time it's a nightmare that continues right up until today in a quite literal sense on the 9th of august 2001 the person that I used to be was the busy chief executive of a Jerusalem pharmaceutical technology startup in Jerusalem. Uh, I've always uh, bounced back and forth between practicing law and technology, both in Australia, where I started my career and started my life, and in Israel. On that very hot afternoon at exactly two o'clock, my wife called me at my desk and was screaming into the phone saying there's been a pigua and she can't find the children and she hung up. What happened in the ensuing 18 hours was a series of unfolding horrors. First of all, trying to reach Malki by phone, getting no answer, um, canceling my meetings after about an hour of, uh, of uh, really staring at the walls uh, in order to go home and care for our youngest child who is brain damaged and uh, continues to live with us, uh, needs care around the clock. Uh, I needed to take care of her so that Frimit could leave the house and do whatever she felt that she ought to be doing. In the end, that meant going to the Shari Tzedek Hospital. Uh, as she left our building, the building where we lived at the time, she met our next door neighbor, Aviva, and uh, the two women discovered that each of them had exactly the same mission. They were looking for their daughters who were together. Um, Frimit and Aviva went to Shari Tzedek. Frimit came home sometime after that. I was already at home. Um, she hadn't found uh, Malki, our daughter, uh, and at around six o'clock, the downstairs neighbor came up the stairs looking ashen faced and said uh, that the Raziel's daughter, Aviva's daughter, had just been announced on the news as having been murdered that afternoon. And uh, things looked awful for us. Um, some hours later, hours later, uh, one of our other neighbors, who was the head of a department at Hadassah Medical Center at the time, came running into the uh, living room, uh, not a young man. Uh, grabbed me by the hand and said, they've got a girl on the operating table, you're coming with me. We drove up to Hadassah. We very quickly 
navigated our way through a scene, as I have said to friends many times over the years, a scene straight out of Dante's Inferno. Uh, people who looked the way I felt, looking for their children or with their children or their friends or their spouses, um, in that horrendous place, uh, it turned out that our daughter was not on the operating table, but a, a doctor who recognized my friend, the Professor Lafayre, came running over to say, who are you looking for? Jerry Lafayre explained it quickly. He said, why don't you go over to that other room? We've got one girl on the table there who's dead and another one we're about to operate on. He was inviting me to make a, an inspection of two girls, one of whom might be my daughter and one of whom was dead and the other was about to be given medical care. It was a, it was a difficult moment beyond words that I can really convey here. Um, we didn't find Malky there. A social worker sized up the situation told me that I should go with one of her social workers to Abu Kabir, which is the National Pathology Lab uh, just on the outskirts of Tel Aviv, um, to identify perhaps the remains of my daughter. I said I couldn't do that. I needed to go home and be with my wife. In the end, my two oldest sons, one of whom had started the army and his military service a day before and had come rushing home to be with the rest of us because he sized up the situation. Those two boys went off. At two o'clock in the morning, they phoned home. The rest of us were sitting there, going out of our minds, arguing with the Almighty, trying to do deals. And the message was that they had found their sister and the, the, the search was over. At that point, Frimit, my wife, ran out of the apartment into the night, screaming with two uh, friends, discreetly keeping some distance. And after a little bit of uh, trying to get myself into some shape of control, I sat down at the computer and began writing a letter to the editor of the Melbourne Age, uh, Melbourne being the city where Malky was born, where I was born, and where I felt that I, I wanted to communicate expressions and uh, feelings that I didn't even know how to put into words. A lot of time has um, passed since the 9th of August 2001, uh, a lot of detail that I've shared in various uh, ways, both speaking to audiences and writing about it. Um, but the reality that we face today, the um, 11th of February, 2021, almost 20 years later, is uh, difficult for me to convey to a rational audience because all of us have feelings like, why is this still going on? Could it possibly be the case that there is unresolved business after all these years? Or as a, a friend of mine who for years ran a radio program in uh, Melbourne, Australia, said not to me, but to our mutual friend, why don't these people get a life? Well, let me tell you about the life that we're living today. Uh, we're not obsessive people. We're not depressed people. We're a functioning family, very close with one another. We have seven children of whom six are alive today. The youngest of our children is profoundly brain damaged. I'm not going to say any more about that other than to say that the damage and the experience of raising a child who was damaged in this way and who needs care 24-7 uh, eventually led us to create a living memorial to our daughter Malki, which is the Malki Foundation, it operates in the United States and in Israel and in the United Kingdom and in Australia, and I'm very proud of it. it it's the basis on which I say that there are not two sides to the coin here, as numerous journalists have tried to say, the murderers and the victims, two sides of the same coin because they're in Israel. We're nothing like them. We're absolutely different, and the Malki Foundation is the proof of that. Where we are today is going into the third consecutive US administration, uh, whom we are tackling in order to have them, the, the Biden administration, the incoming Biden administration, tackle the extremely bothersome manner in which the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan refuses to extradite my daughter's murderer uh, from the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan has been holding onto the architect of the massacre at the Sabara Pizzeria from 2011, when she was one of the beneficiaries of the Ilad Shalit 
transaction between the government of Israel and Hamas. Uh, she's been living in Jordan as, first of all, a hero on the day she arrived there. It's the place where she was born and very quickly escalated from there to true celebrity status. The government of Jordan, the kingdom of Jordan, has facilitated every step of that extraordinary career while without explicitly saying so, refusing the requests of the Department of Justice of the United States of America to hand her over to face charges in Washington under the 1995 extradition treaty signed by King Hussein, the father of the current king, whose name is King Abdullah II, and the government of Bill Clinton at that time. It's extraordinary at multiple levels, and I wish we had more time for me to lay out for you in a sort of dramatic uh, manner the, the striking ways in which a whole array of obstacles had been placed in our path preventing what we want to see done, which is not so complicated. Bringing the murderer, the woman who engineered the massacre to justice. The one element of the intervening years that I do want to mention is why we're even talking about Washington and extradition and Jordan and the United States. Malki was an American citizen. I married an American girl. She's been my American wife for the last 45 years. And our children are also all American, as well as being Israeli and Australian. Under American law, a little known American law, an American citizen murdered in an act of terrorism outside of the territorial United States is the basis on which the United States will go after the terrorist and bring the terrorist, wherever the terrorist may be, into the United States to be adjudged under United States law. It's an extraordinary uh, piece of, of, uh, of, of lawmaking, up to and including the fact that at the time that I went to Washington, accompanied by one of the most admirable lawyers I've ever known, uh, I'm not gonna mention his name now until he tells me that I can mention his name publicly, but he's been extraordinarily solid and supportive and uh, creative in this whole process. He and I went into the Department of Justice in Washington in March 2012, which for those of you who have some historical memory was only a few weeks after the doing of the Gilad Shalit deal. That was October 2011. The woman had been uh, released in the framework of the Gilad Shalit deal and sent back to the country where she was born and raised and had lived until a year or two before the massacre and uh, had been received there as a hero. We went to the Justice Department in, in the knowledge that under US law, the United States must go after the murderer. But sadly, that law had never once been applied in the case of an act of terrorism in the United States. I'm sorry, an act of terrorism outside the United States of a United States national. This was the first instance. The reception that we had there at the hands of a dozen or 20 DOJ and FBI officials was about as positive as it gets. They didn't give away any uh, specific plans, but we were assured that every effort would be made if they could make the case. It took five years, five years from that meeting until we were notified by officials from the Justice Department here in Jerusalem on the night of 14th of March 2017 that the Justice Department not only had already obtained a, uh, a criminal complaint, the equivalent of an indictment against this woman under US law, but had been pressing the Jordanians for the previous four years without anybody knowing about it to extradite her under the 1995 extradition treaty and had failed. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what we learned and why we were disappointed and how horrified we were to see that parts of the United States government, abs and this was the uh, initially the Obama government, then the Trump government, were obstructing the process of seeing justice done. I'm not going to go into those details, not because there aren't details worth knowing, but because that can't be shoehorned 
into the time that we have available here. But if I can make the assumption that you all believe me when I say that incredible obstacles, obstacles of a, of a kind that I think would make your hair stand on end, were thrown in our path and continue to be thrown in our path up until this minute, and then uh, I'll continue with what I think are the strategic issues that uh, we face and that I think that anyone who has a concern both with justice and with the way in which terrorism in Israel is perceived in the United States ought, uh, ought to be uh, concerned with. 14th of March 2021, which is coming up in uh, just over a month, is the fourth anniversary of the day in which the Department of Justice unsealed that criminal complaint that had been filed against Tamimi, Ahlam Tamimi, in 2013, and then kept sealed at the request of the DOJ for four years. The complaint charges her with violating a US federal law uh, along the lines of what I've just said, a, a, a law that prohibits the causing of deaths of American nationals by means of a weapon of mass destruction. And under that law, she needs to be brought to trial in the United States. Jordan is an interesting place. I don't know what sort of feelings there are in this audience uh, about the Hashemite kingdom. I know that for me, it really always had a positive profile. I was there several times in the two years before my daughter's murder uh, under very positive conditions. I was actually setting up a joint venture based on technology with Jordanian partners. I haven't been back to Jordan and in fact, haven't pursued any of those interests since the day that Malki was murdered. But up until that time, had we been having a discussion about who Israel's friends and, and admirers are in the Middle East, Jordan would have been on that list. I'm uh, in a much different place today. Jordan is a key regional ally of the United States. It's the second or third, depending on how you measure it, largest recipient of US foreign aid. Um, we're talking tens of billions of dollars, uh, one and a half to two billion dollars every year in the last uh, decade or more. And yet, faced with the unsealing on the 14th of March, as I said, 2017, of the criminal complaint against Aklam Tamimi, the Jordanian who had been living in Jordan since arriving there in October 2011, Jordan refused. The Jordanian government has never once said we refuse all that they've done in a in really remarkable uh, virtuoso performance has been to allow its highest court, a court with the peculiar name under French uh, law, it's a little bit more uh, self-explanatory, but we're not dealing with French law here, the Court of Cassation, its highest appeals court. The Jordanian court ha held six days after the unsealing of the charges against Tamimi, again, we're talking 2017, exactly four years ago, the Jordanian highest court held extraordinarily that the treaty signed by King Hussein in 1995 with the, with the Bill Clinton administration was ineffective because of a narrow technical constitutional impediment. It didn't offer any other explanation for this. And the impediment was that the treaty had never been ratified by the parliament. And none of this has ever been examined by any journalist it hasn't been on Fox or CNN or OAN or any news platform, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the BBC, that you can think about. It's been, uh, it's been unstated and anything that you know about this case and about ex the extraordinary life that Tamimi has lived in the intervening years, you know only if you've been reading about it on the social media. There's never been a single interview with my wife or me or our lawyers or our supporters or anyone inside the US administration, no ambassador, no secretary of state, no attorney general examining these issues. And yet this woman on the day that I've already mentioned, the 14th of March, 2017, was not only uh, in effect indicted, she was also added to the FBI most wanted terrorists list. There are only 27 people on that list. Only two of them are women. And only one of them has been added in the last couple of decades, and that's Ahlam Tamimi, my daughter's murderer. It's never discussed in the media. What that means is that the Jordanian refusal to extradite has also never been discussed in the media, which means that the vast majority of people to whom I could potentially speak on this matter have no idea that we're coming at this 
from the perspective of Jordan gets a vast amount of money and strategic support from the United States. And when requested to carry out an act of justice says, well, you can finish the sentence. Uh, the, the sense of the rest of that sentence will be no, no, we won't. I'm not going to deal at this stage and probably not at all, unless you, someone raises it as a question with the question of why enough if I simply explain to you what kind of challenges my wife Fremit and I now face in trying to press this process forward in order to see justice done. But let me make the point that Jordan for its part has never explained why it didn't ratify and why its parliament hasn't fixed that problem every day for the last 25 years because ladies and gentlemen it absolutely could and not only it could but it absolutely has in at least a small handful of cases where it's troubled itself to ratify extradition treaties. Jordan has extradition treaties. It has ratified some and has not ratified others. And uh, if I had to sum up my feelings about the ratification flaw, I would say, and I'm not being very generous when I say this, it's invented, it's not real, it should not be taken seriously. And more than that, I don't believe that any official in the United States government does take it seriously. Let me also say, and here I'm, uh, I'm being a little bit evasive because I don't want you to know all the facts. Um, a State Department official, one of the very, very, very small handful of State Department officials who have ever deigned to speak with me, to answer my questions. We've been faced with a wall of obstruction and refusal. An official two summers ago told me in open correspondence that contrary to the Jordanian claims, the United States has instruments of ratification that the Jordanians handed over to the United States in 1995 before the treaty went into effect. Why we, a couple who are doing this in order to see justice for our murdered child, one of 15 people murdered that day, two Americans, a third American by the way, He's unconscious today and has remained in a coma every day, every moment since the 9th of August 2001. Why we are the ones who need to be bringing to the fore the argument that the Jordanians are making this whole thing up. But even beyond the simple fact of the refusal by Jordan to extradite Tamimi is a much larger question of Jordan's strategic importance to the United States in US efforts in the Middle East to overcome radical extremism. That's the popular expression that really means terrorism. And that really begins to go to the heart of the question of why we are so frustrated and so ineffective in our efforts to achieve what ought to be attracting enormous support from the media and on a bipartisan basis from lawmakers right across the United States of America. And trust me what I say, we don't have that kind of support. In all these years, there have been, there have been three mainstream media articles, articles that have reported on what I'm saying, only two of them in the English language and all of them in the last 12 months. Why the media don't wanna pick up any aspect of the story really goes to the heart of What's really going on here? In June 2020, after a long interval where there was no ambassador of the United States in Jordan, a gentleman by the name of Henry Worcester, a career diplomat in the service of the State Department, uh, went through confirmation hearings in Washington for the post of US ambassador to Jordan. And a question was posed to him in writing by the, uh, the by Senator Ted Cruz about the the need to pressure Jordan to extradite Tamimi and in one of the very few highlights of our recent history in this matter the answer from that Korea diplomat was all options are on the table we weren't expecting to hear that all options are on the table um, I want you to know and I won't expand on this again because of a lack of time but the United States legislated in December 2019, some months before that confirmation hearing, legislated a sanction, again, on a bipartisan
partisan basis, on a nonpartisan basis, creating a powerful sanction, which clearly, without mentioning Jordan's name, had Jordan in its crosshairs. But nothing further came, not of what Mr. Wooster said to the Senate when he was being confirmed, nor from the operation of that law, a law of the United States Congress that says that Jordan, without naming Jordan, can have its foreign aid, that 20 or so billion dollars that I mentioned a few moments ago, cut off because law of the United States says that if you have a treaty with the United States and you're in breach of it, and you are a recipient of foreign aid from the United States, the foreign aid ends and the Secretary of State may overturn the sanction. But as far as we know, the sec no Secretary of State has tried to overturn it. And it's never ever gotten any attention from anyone anywhere except for those of us who are pushing to see justice done in the case of Tamimi. A couple more comments about how to think about what Jordan is doing. Jordan, and here I'm sort of sharing with you some of the background conversations that we've had with people who don't want to be quoted on the record, is perceived as having tremendous significance to American interest in the Middle East, but as being very weak that pressing the Jordanians to hand over this woman, while of course the right thing to do, and yes, that would be justice, and yes, she's a monster, and yes, she's been actively agitating for murder of the kind that she carried out and wants people to emulate her. We don't want Jordan undermined. We don't want an unsafe, possibly porous border between Jordan and Israel turned into a battleground. We don't want the status quo to be changed because perhaps the whole kingdom will fall. Or in the words of a notable pro-Israel activist who shared with me his feelings while explaining why he wasn't able to do anything, the sky might fall on the Middle East and I don't wanna have that responsibility on my conscience. There's something quite extraordinary about this rather uh, perplexing the dualistic view of King Abdullah. He's either the weakest uh, figure in, in the complex Middle East scene, or he's the key to peace being achieved there. But he won't be pressed, according to this theory, he won't be pressed to uh, comply with his obligations under the 1995 extradition treaty, because to do so would undermine his kingdom. And of course, the unspoken statement in all of this is, and it's a true statement. This woman is phenomenally popular, not because she's good looking, not because she has the right politics. She's phenomenally popular because she murdered Jewish children. That's what she says she set out to do. And unfortunately she was very successful at it. She set out to murder Jewish children and she succeeded. This has put her at the very highest level in the Jordanian pantheon. There are lots of ways in which the United States could put pressure on Jordan. I, I speak as someone who has actually communicated with lawmakers and other officials in the Trump administration, urging them, in fact, suggesting concrete, suggest, uh, concrete sanctions to impose pressure, to let Jordan understand that there is a price for the decision it's taken, never to explain itself, never to repair the constitutional flaw if it exists, and not to hand over this monstrous woman to face trial in Washington. The US media has been complicit in this process from the beginning up until today. There's never been a word about any of the things that I've just said about the world's most wanted female fugitive anywhere in the, the media that you would recognize as being the leading edge media, not the printed media, not the electronic media. All of this means that Fremit and I are perceived as, well, at least in our own minds, lepers, L-E-P-E-R-S, people whose condition is so offensive that you can't allow them into the conversation, onto the screens, or into people's minds. That's where we are now, almost 20 years after the murder of our beautiful, beloved, in the truest sense of the word, daughter. We want to see justice done, not vengeance. We want to see justice done because the United States needs to send the right message both to friends and to foes about where it stands on terrorism. The United States 
is currently, through three administrations, uh, underscoring its tolerance, tolerance, not intolerance, tolerance of what the Jordanians have done since 2011 in creating a safe uh, environment for Ahlam Tamimi. Some of you will remember, if you've read about this at all, that she had her own television program broadcast from downtown Amman for five years, sent throughout the world, all over the United States, all over Australia, all over Europe, urging more terrorism. If this is the outcome of Jordan's mollycoddling and, uh, and, and extraordinarily uh, safeguarding the murderer of my child, then it's time for a new approach to be taken, for justice to prevail, and for those who are obstructive in this process to be exposed and stopped. I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we do have quite a few questions. We have several, uh, Arnold, that cluster around the Jordan question. Uh, specifically and sympathetic, but asking, for example, would it would it be the case that uh, pressuring Jordan could could um, derail progress on the Abraham Accords? And is that what the government would, uh, doesn't want to risk the Americans, the Israelis? And maybe explain maybe what is what is the narrative you would envision? If they did what you what you would like them to do, what would the impact be? Um, so, so how do you square this? People who are again sympathetic to you and want to preserve the Abraham Accords and and want stability and want broad peace. So, how how do you see this happening in in a in a practical way? So, let me first of all try to have the question itself put under the magnifying glass. The Jordanians have never said any of these things. Jordan's friends have never said any of these things other than scurrilous journalists and people whose opinions aren't really uh, speaking for anybody else, nor are the underlying assumptions ever examined. I could be the big expert here and talk about how the Middle East works, what the dynamic really means, and, but I'm just, a, what am I saying? These are my views. No one on the Israeli side has articulated a position of let's understand this and let's, let's uh, critique it. No one in the United States government has ever acknowledged that the problem even exists. We are, we are the unwon unwanted guest at the wedding. In pressing for justice for the murder of, of our daughter, I always put it in, that, in those terms, for the murder of our daughter, there's a second American woman uh, whose parents we're quite close with and who don't want to be brought into this, but that doesn't mean they don't support us, they support us totally. And there's the family of the young woman who's still unconscious after all these years. So there are three Americans involved here, but the one who's unconscious isn't considered dead. For us, we're, we're a, a kind of a um, proxy for a much larger issue of under what conditions are we prepared to allow a rogue government, which has a treaty, to continue to get away with what it sort of hints at as being a uh, doomsday argument. Press us and the sky will fall. Now, it, 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 I'm not here saying that there isn't some basis to it. I am explicitly here to say no one's ever raised the issue in any serious fashion in any forum of any kind. And that's really at the heart of the problem. It's almost as if these are questions that no one dares to even ask. My own personal view is this is all rubbish. This is absolute nonsense. Either King Abdullah is a powerless weakling in the Middle East, in which case, why are we pumping that kind of money and that kind of logistic support and that kind of military support? The American uh, military has a very large footprint in Jordan if we don't believe that this is a uh, sustainable regime. And it may even be that there are good intelligent answers to that, but these questions aren't even being asked. In the meantime, we are quite literally being wished out of the room. People don't want our case to even be discussed in public. A uh, question here, <coughs> rela <coughs> sorry, related. Uh, what about Israel's attitude? Uh, uh, where where does the Israeli? What's the Israeli zeitgeist? Maybe the the government side, um, the official diplomatic side, the public side. Um, what's the what's the thinking on that score? Um, I'll start at the end. I don't know, and then I'll go to the beginning. 
we're Zionists. We moved to Israel because of a passionate desire to raise our family here. We've never regretted it for a day. I don't know how well that sits with people, but that's the case. Never regretted it for a day. Our children and our grandchildren live here and we're living happy, productive lives and we wouldn't want to live anywhere else. From the day that our daughter was murdered until today, no government official has ever engaged with us, not at the point where they arrested the suspects, put them on trial, convicted them, decided that they were going to release them. No one ever informed us. Everything we know, everything we learned came from the media. Since then, and I speak here as someone who has done a very large number of missions on behalf of the foreign ministry of the government of Israel and the prime minister's office, right up until the time of the Shalit deal, uh, my voice was welcomed. I was Israel's representative in the United Nations when the subject of uh, terrorism was raised there. I'm an articulate person. I'm not afraid to speak in public. I became a leper when the Shalit deal was done and have never been asked to do anything since then on behalf of the government of Israel. And I don't believe that that will change. I must say, and I'm not going to be more explicit than this, that the issues here are narrow, personal, political issues involving specific individuals. And I think that it's a disgrace, along with lots of other disgraces. Israel is not a perfect society, but it's, uh, it hasn't undermined uh, my devotion and commitment and connection to the state of Israel, nor that of my family. Uh, question here about whether the, anyone, any Israeli media has covered the story. Um, seems to me you mentioned the, when we spoke earlier, the, the amazing piece that David Horowitz did. But that, that was in the Times of Israel, is that correct? Exactly. Uh, last May, David Horowitz wrote an epic uh, analysis uh, recording all of the details that I've been reluctant to impose into this limited time um, event that we, we have here. But uh, for anyone who wants it, uh, go do a search on Times of Israel's website and put in my name, Arnold Roth, and Malky's name, and you'll see something phenomenal. The only mainstream Hebrew uh, instance of media coverage in Israel, make of this what you will, is from the newspaper that Israelis call Bibiton, which means the Bibi newspaper, uh, Israel Hayom, Israel Today. Um, a, 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 I have to say, a courageous journalist there uh, approached us to do a story only a couple of months ago, and it was published only a matter of weeks ago. Uh, and that was the very first time that the Israeli media had uh, uh, engaged in even a halfway serious way with this battle that we're conducting through all these years. I don't really have simple answers for why uh, people haven't uh, wanted to get more involved in the story. I can say that I have a personal relationship with the publisher of, without a doubt, the most influential Israeli newspaper, which will have to go unnamed in this conversation, and found that his responses were evasive, dishonest, and absolutely unhelpful. Mm. Question here, uh, having to do with the new Biden administration and uh, the new Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken. Any outreach there? Has that, has that begun? Um, we're planning to do it. I think there's a view that there's uh, chaos at the moment as things get uh, put into shape and people take uh, up various roles. Um, I've just got to remind everybody in this call that this is not an ice cream production company or a Hollywood movie set where a bereaved husband and wife trying to get justice with our own resources with a solid handful of friends, but it's nothing more than that. So we're doing whatever we can do. To a great extent, we, we must crack the, the uh, impenetrable wall of uh, disinterest and, uh, and obstructiveness on the part of the media and in parallel, try to create a bipartisan um, wave of support inside the Congress. And here I'll just take one step into the into deep waters and knowingly putting at risk my aversion to making this sound like it's at all partisan. Um, people have helped us reach out to people in the Congress. We have been, we have been in, in an absolutely uh, straightforward way shut out by almost every Democrat that we've approached. Uh, if I look at the Congress people who have made pilgrimages to Amman in the last two years to meet privately with the King, they've all 
with perhaps one or two exceptions, have all been Democrats and have all refused to engage with us and have never raised the matter of Tamimi and the extradition in any of those discussions as far as we're aware. Uh, there are a number of questions, uh, Arnold, uh, people asking what they, perhaps as the public, could do. Um, is there, you know, there are a lot of people who are sympathetic. There are actually many, many <clears throat> notes here of people expressing sympathy. Just sorry for all of this uh, suffering you've experienced. But, and then the question, what, what can people do? Right. But so, I, I think not, I mean, there's the Karen Malky Foundation, but what can they do for the effort? I'm going to mention two things. First is let camera know that you're interested in trying to help us do something. Um, go to a petition site that we created in order to deliver a petition to uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. He um, made it very clear that he was not interested in hearing anything about it, but we're continuing and intend to hand that petition, which now stands at 14,000 signatures, not enough, um, to the new Secretary of State. Uh, change.org slash extradite tamimi. It's not hard. Change.org slash extradite tamimi. The real um, request that I make time and time again is exactly what Andrea Levin and her terrific team have done here today. Give me a platform. Let me speak to people. Let people look at me, allow me to look at them and say, this is outrageous. This is about justice. We're not looking to negotiate a tax agreement. We're looking to get justice for the <clears throat> We're looking to get justice for the murder of a child. And if we're not able to press this case forward, then there's something really, really, wheels have gone off the cart. There's something seriously wrong. Well, there is something seriously wrong, but that, that's the way I want people to think about this. We're not a, a, um, an agitation organization. We're not trying to reset the way people think about the Middle East. In fact, it doesn't matter whether you're pro-Israel or anti-Israel. This is all about justice and the outrageous conduct of the Kingdom of Jordan, which gets away with it day after day. Arnold, there's a very interesting question pertaining to Jordan and asking, are there any Jordanians who are sympathetic? There are. Um, the petition that I mentioned has um, a significant number of people from the Arab world in general and from Jordan. I want to quickly add, however, that Jordan has a colossally high anti-Semitism uh, penetration rate. Right. It's really one of the most unfriendly countries uh, towards Jews and Israel in the Middle East. And I don't think we're gonna change any of that. But here's the real point about the anti-Semitism in Jordan. Good King Abdullah II, with whom I have no personal argument, has never done one thing about fighting anti-Semitism in his own kingdom. And I can give you as much as you can give, you can give me and give our audience, good reasons why it's perfectly understandable that Jordan should be a cesspool of hatred towards Jews. There's a pretty good argument for it. 80, 80%, 75% of them are so-called Palestinians. The country believes that it's been wronged at every step of the way. And in the case of Tamimi, they've never seen in writing, never in any Arab account, that she confessed to all the charges, that she says she did good, and that other people ought to do the good that she did. At the end of the day, the real arguments about what's wrong in Jordan are not being discussed, not with Jordanians and not with Americans. And there are, and there are a lot of people complicit in that uh, conspiracy of silence. Arnold, where is she now? Where is her husband? What are they doing? What is their situation? Well, if you would have asked me this, Andrea, in uh, up until the end of October, I would have said, I know exactly where they are. I've got photographs of their apartment, all from the public record. They've never been hiding for a single day. The husband, by the way, is also a convicted murderer and as unrepentant as his wife. But from the beginning of October, um, perhaps because of the involvement of the new American ambassador in Amman, and perhaps not, the husband was declared persona non grata and was kicked out of Jordan, according to the media. Now, I don't know what really happened. Uh, what was said at the time was that he decided that he was going to go and live in Qatar and the wife decided that she wasn't going to go and live in Qatar and that she demanded that the king bring her husband back. All of that produced something of an explosion at BBC. I leave that to, to people to explore because that would take another couple of hours to talk about. Uh, but the result is that um, I don't 
have any knowledge that I could share in confidence that I know where either of them are. Um, uh, uh, Ahlam Tamimi has had a, uh, an enormous footprint in the social media. F uh, Facebook continues to give her enormous support. I don't know whether Facebook senior management knows about this, but their lawyers do because we've had letters of demand sent to them and they've been ignored and we're going to be taking action very shortly. Uh, but I can't say that I know precisely where they are today. Certainly up until the 29th of September 2020, I knew exactly where they were. And so did the I, FBI and uh, the government of the United States and the government of Jordan. Arnold, actually, I think people would be interested in what happened at BBC with the social media, the, the trending thing, where you were, you yourself were so forceful to in, in uh, getting getting some redress there, and we helped out uh, in our way. Certainly but did. it was quite. Uh, there's this uh, BBC Arabic has a social media platform and a program called Trending. Is that is that the beginning of the story? So it's in Arabic. Yes, yes. yes. So I, I, what I would do is urge people. Uh, this is this is uh, the most effective way I know. Go to the blog that my wife and I write. And the way to find it is just type in as one word, this ongoing war. That's what we call it, this ongoing war. Type it into Google as one word and you'll come to our blog. And there we've shared the revelations that we put to the BBC and the way they handled it, which was catastrophic from their point of view and certainly not very nice from our point of view. And uh, that's a very live issue. Uh, I believe that we'll see changes in the way the BBC is regulated in the United Kingdom, but, but that's already a, a much larger issue and a different issue. Uh, there's a question here. If you, do you have advice for other families that have lost, lost uh, family members to terrorism? Only one additional case beyond ours has ever been pressed, as far as I know, at the Department of Justice to go after the terrorists who killed their family members or loved ones in Israel. And I, I don't understand why people are so passive about this. We haven't been passive. And we found that the DOJ, um, it, while they didn't do it very quickly, they certainly did what they said they were going to do. And I believe that others ought to, I, I, I believe it's imperative that others do the same. But I think the larger issues here are for people to recognize that when politicians and public figures and even analysts and commentators talk about the preeminence of justice as a value without which our society would eat itself alive, they don't actually mean it. It's really conditioned on, provided that we don't upset some of our important allies in that dark, in the dark corners of the Middle East. Jordan is an outstanding example. I would guess that if people hadn't heard me say these things and I would be asking them, what's your general sense about Jordan? Most people would say, yeah, yeah, they're probably about as good a, an ally as we can find in the Middle East. And I, I'm sorry, but uh, people are just ignoring the realities here because the media are keeping it quiet and their politicians are being dishonest about it. We have serious problems in Jordan. The United States has serious problems with Jordan and no one wants to face up to it. Interesting question here. Is there a warrant issued by Interpol for the arrest of Tamimi? Yes, it's called the Red Notice and uh, there's been one since September 2016. Just to show you how, uh, what you think is happening doesn't really happen. The Jordanians arrested her without any knowledge, any of this being conveyed to the American government for several hours. The only effect of that was that she stopped work, that they arrested her and then released her some hours later. Uh, um, and then quick, let me quickly add, yes, there is a red notice against her everywhere else in the world. And uh, with, with some justice, she has said in public, I can't travel anywhere because I would be arrested by she says Interpol. Interpol doesn't arrest anybody, it just sends out information. Um, but the reality is that when she was arrested, the, the Jordanians never intended for a second to keep her in custody and they did whatever they needed to do to get her out on the street. But they warned her, keep a low profile. And from that day until today, she stopped presenting her TV program. So we can thank Interpol for the fact that uh, her being a lightning rod for uh, uh, inciting more terrorism came to an end that day. But she's found lots of outlets for that ugly passion of hers in the social media. She's all over, as I said, Facebook. She was all over Twitter until we got her to, shut, to be shut down and Instagram. 
a question asking what's what state Fremont is from in the United States, and maybe there's something that can be done from the state level. I, I want to again emphasize that I'm not out to get anybody in the political scene and not to uh -huh. sound like I'm partisan. Fremont is from Kew Gardens, New York. Uh, the congresswoman who represents that district uh, is one of the Congress people most close to the Jordanians. I don't really have much of an explanation for why. I can tell you that we made an approach in good faith to the Congresswoman's office and uh, we, we, we got nowhere. Someone has just mentioned the seven Israeli girls who were killed, um, the Island of Peace, isn't that what, what it was? Exactly. Uh, murdered by a Jordanian Pal uh, Palestinian and no justice was served then and what do you, does that, does that? I would, I would, I would frame that a little differently. Okay. Um, the, uh, the gunman who killed them was originally presented as being simple-minded and um, incapable of uh, really forming any criminal intent, but nonetheless was sentenced to long-term imprisonment and was released after less than 20 years. The horror is not in what this jackass did. It's in the way Jordanian society embraced him when he came out. He's a hero today. He's a hero only because yeah. of the dead Jewish children. Yeah. It's exactly analogous to Akhlam Tamimi. The only thing that she ever did in life that attracted any public attention was placing a bomb at Sabaro and then getting away with it. She's a hero. She genuinely is a hero. But from that, so the absurd claim that uh, complying with its obligations to the United States and extraditing her would bring down the Jordanian government, that is, an un that is a stretch and it, it gets us into some very, very deep and troubling waters. There's a broader question here about fighting terrorism. Uh, is it, with all that you've been through, is there some some wisdom that you, I know you spoke for years. I remember when you were going to Europe uh, on many trips uh, to talk, especially I guess during the, the long terror war uh, about terrorism. Is there anything that you would that you would uh, add at this point uh, uh, from your experience in the broad sense? Um, impossible for me to come across sounding smart if I'm going to do it in, in a minute and a half, which is what I want to do. But I do want to say that terrorism isn't the same as uh, petty larceny or even serious grand larceny. It's something that involves a conflict between um, civilizational outlooks. The terrorists are not interested in the state. They're not interested in better borders. They're interested in destruction. And uh, certainly in the case of Tamimi, she's never made any bones about it. She's also made it clear that she's driven not by concern about occupation or green lines, but about the historic hatred between Muslims and Jews. That's the way she put it. She's, it's on the record, it's on television. <laughs> so people need people, po lawmakers, decision makers, people at the highest levels of responsibility in our societies need to recognize that you can't deal with terrorism by talking it down as a violent extremism. It's not countering violent extremism, which was the, the mantra of the Obama administration. It's terrorists want to get us all. And while they're coming after us, because uh, you hear about them coming after us all the time, they're coming after a much larger population than that. We have to sort out what it is that we think we know about terrorists and act accordingly. I'm, I'm sounding a little um, um, uh, cryptic, but... Uh, that really is this, the first step in a long journey in understanding just how badly we're dealing with terrorism and the threat that it poses to our society, wherever we live, every society. Thank you for that, uh, Arnold. Can, can, you, can you just give us, as we close, a little bit about the Karen Malky Foundation? Um, tell us what, what you do. By the way, again, many, many people sending uh, notes of sympathy and concern. They've, they've signed the change, petition. the petition. Right. So lots of people will be active and, I, and encouraging, encouraging you as well to do more media and to be on radio and so on and interview programs. So, but tell, tell us just uh, as we wrap up about Karen Mulkey. Let me make, grab the opportunity to make a preliminary statement before that and then say something about the Mulkey Foundation. I need invitations to talk to groups because the media aren't going to put the story out. Invite me to your church, to your synagogue, to your men's club, to your ladies club, whatever the opportunity is, any hour of the day, I'm there. Okay, that's the end of that. Malky Foundation is 
one of the things that I'm most proud of in life after my family. Marquee Foundation does wonderful work on a nonpartisan basis. About a third of the people we've helped happen to be from the Arab parts of Israeli society. We focus on the needs of families who are raising, as we are, a child with extreme special needs in the home. There's lots of support for institutions in Israel. There's almost no support for families, which is by far the better option, who are looking after their very disabled child at home. So we provide equipment, we underwrite the costs of therapies, and we advocate for, for better uh, government policies. The work of the foundation is described at www.kerenmalki. Keren is the word for foundation, kerenmalki.org. We have an American arm, and uh, if people would go to the website, go only, if, go, if you're gonna go there, go there to hear the song that Malky wrote, which is called the Song of Joy. It's a wonderful song and it really sums up pretty much everything that I've said in the last hour. Malky's life was luminous. It was snuffed out by a, a woman who is uglier than almost anybody I've ever encountered in life. And the ambivalence and stupidity and obstructiveness of a host of people in the media, in the diplomatic service of the United States, in the governments of three countries, eats me alive every day. I'm not obsessive, but we must achieve justice. And if you can help us, God bless you. Well, Arnold, you know that uh, I speak for everyone on the call, wishing the, wishing you and, and Freema to every strength in this uh, fight for justice. And um, to everyone, please do visit, their visit the foundation. And as Arnold suggests, if you have opportunities to help uh, to bring the, 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 the message to other audiences, that would be greatly appreciated. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Arnold. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to be with you today. And thank you to everyone who's been on the call for joining us uh, and for supporting us. And uh, we will be having webinars coming up in, the, in the, the weeks ahead. Everyone, please stay healthy. Arnold, stay healthy. And uh, we certainly hope that we'll be able to see you in person as we enjoy doing in, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank, thank you, you very much. Again. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank, thank you. you everybody.